Hello and welcome. My name is Meepolis and this is Literally Graphic. And so today, like every day, we are looking at a book that I've meant to reread for a long time. It was one of the few halfway decent graphic novels that my small country library had, but the final volume was only just recently published, so perhaps the timing is just astoundingly good. Anyway, it's Jason Lutz, Berlin, City of Stone, Book One, everyone. Jason Lutz is a white American man who has still managed to create at least one pretty good book. Maybe more. All his books have been fairly well received, but I have yet to read them. And obviously I am the person who gets to decide which comic books are good. And sarcasm. Starting in the late 90s, the Berlin trilogy has certainly loomed large on his Wikipedia page, but he's also done other work including Jar of Fools, The Fall, Houdini, The Handcuff King, and a children's series, The Secret Three and Sam Shade, along with several other short works. In 2008, he joined the faculty at Center for Cartoon Studies, and I guess he remains thusly? Not sure. Berlin City of Stone was originally published as issues by Black Eye Productions starting in 1996, with trades coming out in 2000, 2002, and 2018. Those were published by Drawn and Quarterly because Black Eyed Productions went under for the publication of the first trade and they took over. Moving in onto the back of the book, Berlin City of Stone presents the first part of Jason Lutz's captivating trilogy set in the twilight years of Germany's Weimar Republic. Kurt Severing, a journalist, and Martha Mueller, an art student, are the center figures in this broadcast of characters intertwined with the historical events unfolding around them. City of Stones covers eight months in Berlin from September 1928 to May Day 1929, meticulously documenting the hopes and struggles of its inhabitants as their future is darkened by a groaning shadow. Along with two praising blurbs from the San Francisco, Fran San Francisco Chronicle book review and Time magazine from 2000. It is clear that they are from 2000, at least I would like to think that people think slightly more highly of historical fiction than graphic novel form in 2019, but it's obvious that this was a new idea for them at the time. But maybe I'm just delusional. While this is a fictional depiction of historical events from one person's perspective, having read this almost a decade ago, I was more tuned in whenever the Weimar Republic has come up in conversation since, which has been pretty interesting and honestly ominous. Uh, while I did enjoy the book overall, I would say that the art is a highlight. I mean, I had a hard time telling the women apart for a minute, but the art is otherwise very nice. Plus, there's a lot of female characters to get mixed up, so good. Dramatic black and white with great line quality. The style of the, of the tone is also perfectly matched with the fact that this is an ominous historical fiction graphic novel. The way gender and sexuality are treated in this comic is interesting because the way that the gender and sexuality were being treated in that time and place was also interesting, and I'm glad that Lutz did not shy away from that, even if it's not coming front and center either. FYI, everyone, a lot of interesting LGBT plus positive culture and research was happening in Germany before the rise of the Nazis. Certainly not something ever to be repeated, no? There is some nudity in this book, but there's actually full frontal and flaccid male nudity, which is fairly rare, and certainly no erotic fixation on dominating vaginas. So gold stars all around. With race being such a contentious issue, to put it disgustingly lightly, in World War II, Lutz seemed to be setting the stage for what is to come in a way that shows Germans that fall all along the spectrum politically. Although the proto-Nazis are all tertiary, um, the closest we get is with one older policeman we see a couple of times pulled between his lived experience fighting side by side with Jewish Germans and World War I and the first signs of official political crackdowns on communists. Not that those thing, two things sound equal, but we generally see him among younger, overtly anti-Semitic co-workers as the crackdowns begin, which is when his flashbacks to World War I do come up. And the idea that political crackdowns are tied with the lead up to the Jewish death camps is not how World War II was presented to me in school, but since then I've gathered it seems a bit more on the nose. Much like 
but long before Stranger Strange Fruit Volume 2 used a Sambo icon as visual shorthand for racial slurs, Lou to replace swastikas with plain white circles. Me being not terribly bright, it did take me a minute or two to catch on to this fact, but it's pretty obvious in retrospect and for the best. I should also mention that we do follow at least one Jewish German family and the growing level of racially motivated violence they are experiencing. But the way that Lutz mostly focuses on the fairly everyday and timeless problems that the characters face is unsettling and will likely only become more so as the screws keep turning tighter and tighter. I wish this book was a little less pertinent to my current life, but such is life. Bye all, keep reading and resist fascism. And as always, I would like to acknowledge that for the most part, all of my videos are filmed and produced on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat Nation, land covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant.